where does creativity come from if not empty space? Mm -hmm. You know, infinite possibilities is empty space. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to let you know that this episode contains some colorful language. So if you're listening with kids, you might want to save this episode for later. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. That's pharmacy with an F, F A R M A C Y, a place for conversations that matter. And today's conversation matters if you care about your soul and you care about love and you care about family and you care about making the world a better place. Because our guest today is doing that every single day, day in, day out. I've known him for many years. I've been a fan, actually. <laughs> we haven't got to hang out that much, but I, a little bit. And his work is is telling stories through poetry that change people's lives. Hmm. Uh, and I'm so excited to have him here. His name is In Q. He's a National Poetry Slam champion, an award-winning poet, a multi-platinum songwriter. His groundbreaking achievements, including being named to Oprah's Super Soul 100 list of the world's most influential thought leaders. That is no small feat. He's been the first spoken word artist to perform with Cirque du Soleil. He's featured on A&E, ESPN, HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, sports rapping poetry on ESPN. That's great. He's inspired audiences around the world, including me, through his live performances and storytelling workshops. And many of his recent poetry videos have gone viral with over 70 million views. And I'm really excited to have you here in Q. Thank you for joining the Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm, I'm a fan of yours as well. So, you know, I was uh, checking out your book that's coming out. Uh, inquire within a yeah. book of poetry and uh, you know poetry is sort of kind of in a way in our fast digital culture people just don't take the time to deeply dive into poetry and it yeah it is one of those things that shapes people that moves people it's a different it's different than a novel it's different than nonfiction book because it it, it brings us together in ways that, that and moves us in ways together that other words can't. Um, and, and just to share a little bit about your book, it's it's a, it's a book that contemplates universal issues of love, loss, forgiveness, transformation, and belief. Um, your book, Inquire Within, shines a light on our lives and provides a wholly unique and dynamic lens through which to think about ourselves and our world. It's rhythmic, it's original, it's authentic, inspiring. It's a journey to the center of the soul, which I think is a good place to be today in, in our chaotic world where we're so far away from our soul. Inquire Within sure. is a provocative, entertaining debut from an award-winning poet. You'll never look at poetry again the same way, and you will probably never think about yourself and your place in the world the same way. So I'm so excited. It's, it's, uh, it's really a tremendous book of poetry, and I think something that we need to be focused more on as a pause from the chaos of life to savor what really matters and to think about things that really matter in a different way. So thank Mark, you for thank doing you, that. Thank yeah, you for doing I, I that. I appreciate everything that you said right now. It really, it touches me, man. I think that one of the reasons that I wrote the book and that it was entitled Inquire Within is because I had to inquire within myself to create it. And the person that's reading it and holding it in their hands, they have to inquire within the pages and ultimately inquire within themselves. Because when you think about this modern day society that we're in, consumerism, the culture basically trains us to look outside of ourselves for validation mm -hmm. over and over again. All and, this, I mean, I, I think the best way to solve that would be to turn the flip function off on the phone so people can't do selfies. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's funny, uh, I was visiting the prison that Mandela was in wow. for years and years and wow. years in South Africa once. And as we were passing his cell, somebody took out their phone and took a selfie of themselves smiling in front of the cell. And I was like, they are not present to why they're there or the experience that he had. Yeah. Um, and they're not reflecting. So I think really that's what I was talking about is everything is trying to take from you. It's trying to take your attention. It's trying to take your money. It's trying to take your likes, your information, your love. And technology is this incredible thing that was, you know, created to bring the world together. And yet with all of this technology and the internet and even what we're doing here today, you know, we'll never be able to quantify the ripples of this getting put out into the world. And that's wonderful. It's a really beautiful thing, but it's also isolating people. Yeah. People feel more alone than they've ever felt in their entire lives, and they don't feel a connection beyond their screens. And so I think there's a difference between, you know, using these tools and these tools using us, you know, and 
you know, if if you think about what people need more than anything else right now, it's actually being quiet to find their own answers. Mm. You know, if I don't know something, I automatically look on Google or, you know, I look in a book, you know, I try to find the answers outside of myself and really people need to inquire within. And I hope that this book winds up being a window for them to do that yeah, within themselves. So good, which is so powerful. And for you, I mean, it, it sort of was sort of a sideways journey into being a poet. You never sort yeah. of set out to be a spoken word poet. I don't think there's any and... straight way journey into being a poet, you know? <laughs> I mean, how, how did you how did you get into this? Because, you know, it's like a very novel career and you're you're smashing it. Thank you. But how, you know, I'm like, I, I would love to get up and say poetry and tell stories all day, but like, how am I going to pay the rent? But right. you figured out, you know, how to do this in a way that's so powerful that moves people and, and people gravitate to you. So how, how did you get from like have knowing intention to being a poet to being yeah. this killer poet well first of all it took me a really really long time to figure out how to monetize it i mean i was not doing it for money or you know fame or anything like that i was doing it because i was passionate about storytelling and sharing my experiences mm. through this particular art form mm. but mm. i started out rapping when i was 13 years old and uh you know i grew up in a single parent uh household my mom's a school teacher my dad wasn't around and so uh, I think freestyling initially, when I fell in love with it, was my first form of meditation. Mm. Because when you're freestyling, you literally can't think of anything else but the next word that you're saying. You know, it puts you in the moment like nothing else can, and it provides an outlet for you to get thoughts and emotions out of your system that you might not have another avenue to do so. So that was a huge thing for me. And then when I was 19, I wound up in an open mic for poets in Los Angeles called The Poetry Lounge. Oh, isn't that where like Jack Kerouac and all those guys? Or was that was that, if, that was a different? No, I don't think Jack Kerouac ever came to the lounge, but um, they were part of the beat movement. Yeah, this was kind of the spoken word movement. Yeah, and it was a different time period, but the talent was insane, and it was the first time that I ever, from an audience standpoint, saw people being celebrated for their vulnerability. Uh, I mean, if someone would get up and say something true, you know, it's three hundred fifty people in the audience every single Tuesday night and they would be like oh whoa you know and snap and you know so there was a lot of uh alchemy that mm, was happening mm. in the room of taking these stories and this pain and transforming it into something beautiful and I just never left I started doing my rapping acapella people responded and that was mm. that was the beginning of me becoming a poet it's true you know we make sense of the world through story yeah you know I, I tend to be fact driven and more concrete but the truth is that we we change through story we change through our emotional context and through having our heart touched and our soul mood i mean that's that's what actually drives people to change and grow and learn and and yeah. it's, it's such a gift to be able to take that can i just say something yeah. off of what you said because yeah. i i feel that you actually are incredibly good at taking facts and turning them into story yeah. Like that's something I try. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that. Well, I've seen yeah. you speak a number of times and every single time you engage the audience, you make them lean in, you put it into your books. And I think that's very important is to find a way to make facts entertaining for people so that they walk away with something specific that they can then apply to their life. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, but, you know, it's the artists that and the creators and the, the, the sort of dreamers that actually change the world right yeah it's like it's that, that like that old apple ad you know think different uh yeah. and, and it's the disruptors and i i think in our world where we're so all disconnected from each other and we're so not in our soul journey uh the this book inquire within is is such an invitation to get back to that mm. and uh you know I, I i think you know we're so distracted digitally that we've lost the ability to just be with ourselves yeah uh, I grew up, I'm 60 years old, so I grew mm. up with no cell phone, with no internet, with right. no email, with no texting, with no social media. And it wasn't until I was, you know, God, it was like in my 40s that really it started to come on. And, right. And I, uh, and I remember those times of just savoring, of just being, of reflecting, mm. of wandering, of walking. And um, it's necessary. It's, and I, you know, I, you know, really been focusing more and more on like leaving my phone at home yeah. and not bringing it. And with my wife, for example, you know, I, I gave her a present, which was a little box in the, and she's like, Oh, that's such a nice box. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I, I put, a, put my phone in the box and leave it there for the weekend. <laughs> right. And you get the gift of my presence, you know, that's beautiful. And that's what, and she started crying and, you know, I'm not always good at it, 
but um, I, I've I realized that that uh, you know I thought I did it for her. Yeah. And when I had that weekend to myself, I just was able to lay on the floor and listen to jazz and play with the cats and not have to look at my phone every totally. three seconds. You know. Yeah. It's, it's such a it's, it's such a horrible habit that takes us away from the the spaciousness from the spaciousness of needing to be able to actually connect with ourselves. So, and it's, also it's like where does creativity come from if not empty space? Mm -hmm. You know, infinite possibilities is empty space. So that's why people practice through meditation, and my meditation practice has been, you know, a non-negotiable part of my life. But that's one avenue to finding that space. Even just sitting down and being in nature or being by yourself in the silence and seeing what comes up, you know, but not using a mantra or an anchor to get down, which mm. is, as I said, non-negotiable for me. Yeah. But there are other ways to find that space and to find that silence. And you might be surprised at the answers that come out of that. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I mean, how I became a doctor was I basically grabbed my backpack, mm -hmm. filled it up with a week's worth of food, and just walked for a week. And just really? walked and walked. I went backpacking in the Shenandoah Valley and all by myself. And I just had this incredible spaciousness and time to mm -hmm. really reflect and be and think. And Do you um, remember the moment that it clicked in for you? Yeah, I'm like, I really want to do something where I'm in contribution and service and, mm -hmm. you know actually add something to the world and um you know i felt like why not because i wasn't pre-med at all it was after mm. i graduated from college i'm like okay now what i got a degree right. in buddhism so what the heck am i gonna right. do <laughs> gonna that's be, cool man i'm not gonna become a monk but uh the principles of buddhism are about healing it's right. really about healing the mind and healing the soul and it's all sort of connected and it just sort of took me to like okay well why don't i try being a doctor and and it sort of worked out. It's been okay. <laughs> well, you've also been able to bridge those two worlds. Yeah, yeah. You know? but, it, but it was it was really taking that long, extended solo walking, right. being in nature with no nothing. Right. You know, just me and my backpack and my little camp stove and my yeah. sleeping pad. And my, you yeah. know, I don't think we had Patagonia back then. <laughs> but right. It was it was just a really special moment, and 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 I think it's it's I'm, I'm actually. My wife and I were talking about it last night. Um, you know, my life is so on, right? right. I'm doing so many things because I feel compelled to be a contribution to what's good in the world. And you have momentum, so you want to, of course, follow yeah. your enthusiasm and your momentum. Yeah, but I'm like, you know, we're just talking about it. Like, I think I want to take a week or two and just go have a solo journey. I don't know what or where or how, but I, I feel like, you know. I it, absolutely support that. I think you should 100% do it. I mean, even just... It's like people soul think food. you need to yeah people think you need to be around other people to feel less lonely nature can make you feel really connected just being with nature because you know it's like i was thinking this the other day the birds aren't singing to win a grammy you know <laughs> they don't they don't want to go platinum you know no, they don't, they don't have, want to get on oprah <laughs> they don't care man you know they are in nature they are nature and mm. so when we're around nature it is as you said an invitation for us to step more into the moment mm. and to fully be present you know I'll, that's so true um and a lot of art uh comes from pain yeah and, and you talk about some of the challenges you've had about your dad not being around yeah you know growing with challenging environment uh some of the setbacks and failures you've had and, and you also say how it can be our greatest celebration so how do we sort of reframe challenges in our life to a place where we can grow and and how have you done this for yourself well the celebration comes from the transformation you know so i think you have to celebrate it first you have to you know everyone's so afraid of their pain in our society mm. we are so fucking afraid of our pain man and everyone's finding ways to run from themselves so that they don't have to feel it but the reality is, is if it doesn't come up and out, it will manifest itself in other ways in our lives. And there's nothing really to be afraid of. And so if we could find a way to celebrate our pain, to feel through it, to release it, to transform it, that is a pure form of alchemy. And you can do that through creation. You can do that with sharing. You can do it in many, many ways. You can do it through yoga, you yeah. know, athletics. 
activities that you decide to do sitting with nature as we discussed but you have to do it and the first thing is to not try to hide from it within yourself or with other people because we might have different circumstances but we're all going through the same human experience mm -hmm. and and you know for you um you know the challenges you face sort of i imagine were what what spurred you to start to write and to speak your truth and to talk about the hard things yeah right I mean, it certainly was the biggest outlet for me. You know, poetry ultimately has been the biggest outlet because, you know, and even when I teach workshops, all I'm really doing is providing people an opportunity to explore these moments who have changed who they are through this particular art form. And when they do something like that and they choose something that's moving and meaningful to them, they get the story outside of their system. And when they can see it, they have more separation from the story and the story doesn't own them as much. Mm. So they have a sense of empowerment. And then when they give it away and they see the mirror of humanity in other people's eyes, they have a sense of feeling less alone. So I had that same experience. I'm trying to provide people the same experience that I've had with poetry over and over and over again. And all the things that I'm writing are really just, you know, either me purging or praying. Yeah. But they're reminders to myself of the life that I want to live. Yeah, so powerful. You know, and I think in, in the telling of those stories, it, there's something that happens. And, and it's happened to me many times when I've listened to you um, say your poetry. It, it, it's almost like a, it's like a crack that happens. Like mm. a, a, something snaps where you shift your perspective, mm. where you see things in ways you didn't see them before, where you make connections you didn't make before, where you're inspired in ways that you didn't realize you need to be inspired. You, you're emboldened to make changes based on, you know, what happens from the raw telling of the truth in that form. Hmm. And it's sort of unlike anything else. I mean, you can watch a movie, you can listen to music, you can watch a play, and maybe it'll do some of that. Yeah. But there's something sort of magical. And I, I think, uh, you know, you've really been able to sort of break through some of those stories that you, where your origin stories, how, how do you help people break through the stories that they create for themselves well first of all i just want to piggyback off of what you said some of my most incredible art experiences have been in the audience watching poetry yeah. other poets getting up and sharing their lives yeah i mean it's really been transformative for me so i think that inspired me to do that within myself and now i hope that i'm inspiring other people to do that within themselves uh, when i do the actual workshops you know as long as people start in a place that's true and then they give it time and space the poem will surprisingly almost write itself mm -hmm. and that's my process I mean people ask me all the time where do you get your inspiration from and I just say I pay attention I pay attention if something moves me you know if something annoys me if something <laughs> inspires me and then I start there and then I try to get out of the way yeah you know because I'm the vehicle and the obstacle for my art it's more of downloading than writing, is that it? <laughs> yeah, but it's downloaded through my experience. So yeah. it's like I have to be there. You know, like people always talk about the ego, you know, how to lose the ego. You can't lose the ego. You, you know, your ego is a part of humanity. There's no way to lose your ego, but you cannot operate from your ego as much. Right. You know, you can find a way to know that your ego is a part of you being, you know, involved in this human experiment or this illusion of separation. You know, yeah. Speaking of separation, what what effect did your father's absence have on you, and and um, how did it sort of be a force for good in your life, even though it was sort of bad? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I have a poem that I explore this in the book. It's called Father Time, um, and uh, it really kind of delves into my whole experience, and ultimately, it's about forgiveness, full circle. You know, it came to me forgiving myself and uh, forgiving him and being grateful, you know, because who would I be without that experience? Yeah. I certainly wouldn't be who I am today. I would be someone else, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't be who I am today. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is every single thing that happened to us, whether we understand it or not, we choose to be a victim to it right. or to be empowered by the transformation that comes from it. Right. And um, I mean, it's not a product it's a process hmm. and i'm still of course working on it
but I have a lot of peace with that subject yeah. in my life now. So great. Um, it sort of reminds me of a, a book by Ram Dass who just died mm, called yeah. Grist for the Mill. Like mm. Everything is grist for the mill. Mm. Everything is sort of juicy stuff for us to do our soul work with. Yeah. Right? And it's, it, I think even in our culture, the whole idea of soul work is not something we really think that much about anymore. Right. Uh, we're so outward focused. And, and in, in some ways we've been co-opted by, you know, large tech companies and right. large businesses that are actually capturing our attention, designed to be addictive, right. that so usurps our free will and that drives us into choices that don't serve our good right. and serve their good. Yeah. And, and in, in a way, poetry is like a, like a, like a sword that cuts through all that. Yeah. And I think it brings you back to what is true. Um, I think poets have uh, a responsibility, like all artists, to speak truth to power, but they're also speaking truth to illusion. Yeah. You know, there's this mass distraction machine mm. <laughs> that is always trying to take, you know, and poetry doesn't want anything from you right. other than to be. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Before we continue, we have a quick message from Dr. Mark Hyman about his new company, Pharmacy, and their first product, the 10 Day Reset. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC, and I call that system the 10-Day Reset. The 10-Day Reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, click on the button below or visit getpharmacy.com. That's getpharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Now back to this week's episode. Uh, we can talk about poetry all day, but I, I, I'd love for you to share a couple of poems. For sure, The yeah. first one I really want to hear is in the book, uh, Inquire Within, which everybody should get. It's um, a phenomenal uh, doorway to wisdom, the soul, to cracking open parts of yourself that probably need to be cracked open. Hmm. Um, and the first one's about love. So can you tell yeah, us a little bit about it and then share the poem with us? Absolutely. And I appreciate you saying that, man. Um, so this first piece is called 85. And I originally wrote it because I used to live in this little back house. And the woman that owned the main house, her mom moved in at a certain point. Her name's Dolores. Mm. She was in her 80s. Mm. And uh, <laughs> we shared a kitchen together. You and, and grandma. So, yeah. And basically, we would sit, we'd have coffee, we'd talk about <laughs> life and love and my ex girlfriends at the time, you know. <laughs> and uh, I came to really love her, man, you know. And after she was there for about six months, uh, I woke up one night, it was like three in the morning, and I had this big window and I could see the lights uh, from the ambulance outside mm. the blinds. And she was getting taken away on a stretcher. Mm. I watched her. And she was still alive, but she was having major health complications. And I went and I visited her in the hospital and she had tubes in and out of her system and she had a really high fever and she didn't recognize me. And uh, they said that she was in uh, real trouble. And so I sat with her for a while and I just basically like said my goodbyes because I thought that that was her time and I didn't want her to suffer anymore. Mm. But she got better All right. and they ended up getting her better enough to where she could move to a retirement community. And after about a month of her being in this retirement community, I went and visited her and we were literally like sitting outside and, uh, you know, she was in a really good mood. We were in the garden hmm. and I was like, Dolores, why are you in such a good mood? And she leans in and she goes, I met a guy. Ah! And so in the month <laughs> she was in there, she literally met a guy <laughs> and they had started dating. Wow. Love that. And I just thought that was so beautiful, you know, not only because love could be around any corner, but because I thought her life was over. over. And not only did she survive, she was excited about something again. Yeah. She was surprised by something again. And oftentimes, at any age, people just become 
obligated to the choices that they're making. Ossified. You know, and they just like look around. They're not surprised. They're not excited. Mm. And I'm curious, what will I be like in my 80s? What will I wear? You know, what will I want <laughs> to be enthusiastic? <laughs> yeah, it's like probably the exact same thing. <laughs> but like, what will I want to explore? You know, and so that's where this poem Amazing. came from. Right, it's called it, 85. Give it to us. I want to fall in love at 85. Go on shuffleboard dates. <laughs> and dance to hip hop from 95. <laughs> we would also listen to the song Staying Alive. <laughs> but only for the message. Otherwise, we'd keep away from disco. It's depressing. We'd rock matching tracksuits and rope gold chains. We'd look like Run DMC, but in their old age. We'd take aerobics classes and wear bifocal glasses and eat at IHOP and hold hands at Sunday masses. And when it comes to the bedroom, well, nothing much would happen in the bedroom because we're 85. But we would still be down to take a walk or take a drive or sit and talk or have a drink, watch the passers-by, ask each other why and how and who and where and when, and then we'd laugh and cry again about the people we had been. Mm. And I would touch her withered skin and comment on how thin it is to keep in something infinite. And she would smile sweet and blush, then tell me that I think too much. She's right, I think too much. It's always been a problem. But then again, that's how I made my green like the goblin. When I was in my 20s, I was eating top ramen, counting up my pennies, saving up to go food shopping. But now I'm 85. And somehow I feel more alive. I turned my hearing aid up and bumped Jurassic 5. Or the Jackson 5. I read the sports page while she peruses classifieds. We like antique stores, garage sales, and barter buys. And when it comes to the bedroom, well, hopefully, every once in a while, she lets me knock her boots into the floral patterns of our bedpost, then hold her head close like death isn't chasing us, planning on erasing us and replacing us with better versions of us, reshaping us, remaking us, then recreating us with new identities so we can make new memories. Hush, little baby. Learn to walk and talk and think and lie and feel and fight and love and die and never get the answers why. She dips a joint of grass in wheat grass and we get high. <laughs> Her hair is silver as the moon in the Miami sky. We still pop pills, but it's not the molly anymore. <laughs> Whenever we can't sleep, we listen to the ocean floor. She got a sound of the CCD for me from the Brookstone store. And ever since, I've been snoring like a, like a, like a really good metaphor for snoring. <laughs> Sorry, I go blank sometimes. <laughs> what? I'm 85. <laughs> I'm not complaining. I'm just happy that I'm still alive and happy that I have my better half by my side, super fly. She doesn't look a day over 75. When I first saw her, I was totally in awe. She was classical, so I was like, yo, yo, ma. And that was all it took. A single look and I was shook. I fell for her like some loose shingles from our Spanish roof. And I'm a lover till she loses every last root and has to glue dentures to her gums to chew solid food. Ooh. Now that's real love, dude. That's some push-comes-to-shove love. Not when it's convenient love. Hospital bed love. Feed her ice chips, love. Never leave the room, love. Sleeping in the chair, love. Pray to up above, love. Have to pull the plug, love. Miss her in my bones, love. Everything about her, love. Die within a month, love. Can't live without her love. Love. 
the only reason that we are alive and none of us should have to wait until we're 85. Wow, <laughs> made me cry. Yeah. Holy shit, wow. Uh, I don't think I've ever cried in my podcast before. <laughs> It's all good, man. Thank you, you know, for, it's like, uh, for listening. Woo. Um, oh. um, what uh, what touched you about it? Oh, wow. See, that's the thing about poetry. You can talk about it all day, but then it's like spiritual surgery. Yeah. And it just, it's like I found myself having the chills, mm. laughing, crying, like just longing, um, remembering what's important. Mm remembering what I want mm. um, remembering what matters mm. and, and like yeah it's like wow holy shit you know what man like first of all I, I appreciate your your vulnerability because it makes me feel closer to you you know I, I see that as strength and it makes me feel connected to you in a deeper way yeah and I have the same experience I mean I, I cried the first time I wrote that oh. because it was reminding me of the same things that you're talking about feed her ice chips love man wow <laughs> it's yeah. like you know um you know and i mean i wonder does the does the book come with a box of kleenex because <laughs> <laughs> i think you should do a package thing where the book <laughs> well you know it's interesting the book has you know there's there's two ways to consume it and both are different you know the the, the book has 60 illustrations so uh, we worked with an amazing artist named Musa Sharik in London. And uh, he created these really, really deep and layered illustrations around the concepts of the poetry that helped to kind of bring you into a, um, a more, you know, connected experience. And it, it gives you something else to look at. Yeah. And then the way that we formatted everything and the way that we put the order is meant to bring you through this conceptual through line. There's two halves. There's inhale uh, and exhale. And inhale is personal poems, and so it's almost like my own poetic hero's journey. And then exhale is social and political, and yeah. it's change yourself, and then you can change the world. So that's one way to to kind of consume it. And then the other way is the audiobook, which is me, you know, recording all of these poems, yeah. and then you get to hear the rhythms and the stylistic things, mm. the voices that I'm using, mm. and both are interesting to do on their own, and then they're really fascinating to do Dude, together. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is literally, it's the first time I've ever had a home for my art. I've been writing yeah. poetry for 25 years. So someone asked me the other day, they were like, how long did the book take? And I was like, 25 well, years. Yeah, 25 <laughs> years, pretty much. I mean, it, it, I've been working on it over a year. But then one of the oldest poems in the book, the father piece is 14 years old. Wow. And it took me 10 years to make that 14 year old mm. poem. So wow. 25 years. All yeah. I can say is Rilke has some stiff competition. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> He's one of my favorite poets who gets the same way inside, under your skin and into your soul. Wow. So we could talk a lot more, but, um, you know, that was a, that was a within poem. Mm. And um, I would love you to share a without poem. Yeah. A poem about being in the world. Yeah. And what we all need to do is in community to actually deal with the real issues we're facing. And, you know, one of them I talk a lot about on the podcast is food system and climate yeah. change. And, you know, we were recently at an event for a nonprofit called Kiss the Ground, mm -hmm. which everybody should check out, which trains farmers and creates educators around regenerative agriculture. And, and you did this really compelling poem about climate change and the earth and the soil. And, uh, you know, it's something I know a fair bit about, but uh, it just really opened up my eyes in so many ways. And I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, happy to. I hope um, I don't cry in this one, too. <laughs> oh, um, gosh. You know, I'll say one thing before I start. I watched the State of the Union last night oh, God. with everyone else. <laughs> and he didn't mention climate change one time. Mm. The biggest existential threat to humanity right now was not even fucking mentioned. No. And it just made me so angry. Yeah. You know, so this is a poem that that I wrote about uh, climate change because climate change doesn't give a shit about our nations. It doesn't care about our religions. It doesn't care about our races. You know, if a spaceship showed up right now, parties. it doesn't care about anything, man. You know, it is the great equalizer. Mm, it's true. So um, I think we need to all wake up to yeah. that. 
You know, and, it's interesting. I just a little side note before you start on the poem. I just I just bought this book, We Are the Weather, by the mm. Jonathan Safer Foyer, who, you know, the first two chapters have nothing to do with climate change. The first chapter is about how every molecule of air we take in, you know, contains other molecules from people who breathe breaths on the planet, from Julius Caesar mm-hmm. to Hitler, to, right. you know, like, right. and going back forever. So we're literally breathing in the breath of Jesus Christ. We're mm. breathing in the breath of Moses and Muhammad and Martin Luther King and whoever mm. walked the planet. And, mm. and we all are all the time in every breath. So we're so connected th- through so many different ways. Right. But, so we're all one community and, and we all are connected. And the second chapter was about how during World War II, um, you know, the United States, even though it was in an imminent danger of attack, hunkered down and created victory gardens. All the lights went out at dark so the U-boats couldn't see where we are. But even inland they did. Mm. They had planes flying over the Midwest because they were sort of telling people we need to be part of this. They had people ration their food. They had, in fact, people got healthier because mm. they ate less sugar and right. flour and other things. So we came together as a nation to fight a common enemy. Right. And we did it through sacrifice that right. actually prevented the ultimate sacrifice, which was the end of our, of our world as we know it. Yeah. So I think it's the same kind of thing. We need to get that we're all in this together, and then we get that we need to make changes. So share with us your poem. Yeah, I, I, can I just piggyback on that for sure. a second? Because that is exactly right. It, it's not even climate change. This is a, a war. We need to all look at this like it's a world war against our own behaviors of mm. greed. Mm. You know, I mean, it's crazy that we're still profiting off of the suffering of people and the planet and that we're OK with rewarding that. And this fucking ridiculous argument that like, well, America could change policy, but the world is huge and there's a lot of other places that are using energy at a quicker pace. It's just we should be leading by example. Yeah. It's not even an argument that's worth discussing. Yeah. You know, so uh, it is an actual responsibility, an existential responsibility. You're not going to have to convince kids that climate change is real. They're going to be experiencing it on a moment to moment basis. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're just like, you know, sacrificing our ch- children's future. Yeah, yeah. And so this is something that I wrote about it. It's called uh, One Little Dot. And uh, it's really ultimately about definitions and ownership mm. of this particular issue. It, it's true because most people feel disempowered. Yeah. And we can't do anything, but you, you bring it back home. Yeah. And I've felt that way many times. <clears throat> yeah. And yet, here we are. How can something this big be invisible? The environment is everywhere, and yet it isn't visible. Maybe if we saw it, we would see it's not invincible and have to take responsibility as individuals. How can something this big big be invisible if it's all around us it should show itself on pure principle the scientists are certain that the damage is residual and climate change data is reaching levels that are critical yet somehow that's political we argue over math our citizens are too cynical to believe in facts we make excuses and hold on to the recent past We don't want to sacrifice, so we refuse to ask. I grew up in a city. It's all I ever knew. So even now, I have nothing to compare it to. I have to hit the park to see more than a tree or two. I have to visit nature like it's in a fucking zoo. (laughs) But California was wild before the parking lots, before the mass malls, before designer shops, before the strip clubs, before the sea change, when mountain lions roam freely over freeways, before the fast food, before the freeze frames, we live around a bunch of dead shit these days. It's not an argument for better or worse. It's an observation on how we've been treating Mother Earth. See, we protect what is ours. My land, my life, my house, my kids, my job, my wife, my dog, my car, my country, my culture. But when it comes to nature, our perspective is external. The planet, the forest, 
the ocean, the sky, the mountains, the valleys, always the, never mind if it's not me, never mind, I'm too busy all the time, and without the ownership, we ignore the warning signs. Just look at all the species on the planet that are dying. The coral reefs, the honeybees, mysteriously dying. One fourth of all the mammals that exist are dying. A third of all amphibians are at the risk of dying. We're on a path to mass extinction. It's almost like we're trying because we're relying on an atmosphere that we've been frying. I could use more statistics, but you probably think I'm lying because over half the politicians we elect deny them. Well, since when did their opinions outweigh the science? I thought experiments were fundamentally unbiased. Capitalism uses nature as its example and excuse for competition. The only problem is we've removed it from the ecosystem. Profit and balance in the market are attainable, but growth without a conscience is completely unsustainable. I mean, a lion doesn't kill all the gazelles. Why do we have to have it all to ourselves? Pretty soon, there'll be nothing left but concrete and cars. And when you see an animal, it'll be like seeing a movie star. The planet, the forest, the ocean, the skies, the mountains, the valleys, always the. Never mind if it's not me. Never mind. I'm too busy all the time. And without the ownership, we ignore the warning signs. Our planet, our forest, our ocean, our skies, our mountains, our valleys, always we, always mine, my planet, my forest, my ocean, my sky, my mountains, my valleys, always we, always mine, always ours, always yours. One little dot in trillions of stars. One little dot. It's all that we've got. We just forgot that none of it's ours. We just forgot that all of it's ours. One little dot in trillions of stars. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, it's easy to, it's easy to make it their problem. Yeah. Not my problem. And I think it's so different to shift the frame to thinking about this as something that matters to us. Yeah. Like that, that ownership conscious question is just so not in the dialogue. And yeah. I think that's why there's so much polarization. It's like, you know, I always joke, everybody's favorite radio station is WIFM, what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. But the definition of me needs to be a little bit bigger. Right. Right. Because without all this, there's no me or we or us. Right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm once again, relearning that every time I speak the poem and finding new ways that I can do that for myself when I fall back asleep. Yeah. You know, wow, this is such incredible work. I, I, you know, I, I heard a lot of poets and, you know, there's, there's a difference about your work that has, you know, um, deep spiritual lessons in it that are, you know, I think a lot of poets try to imbue in their poetry, but it's really hard to do. And, uh, I'm, I'm just so moved every time I hear you, like, I'm so grateful that you're doing this work in the world. Thank I think, you, man everybody needs to get this book inquire within get the audio book and get the book get Thank them you, both man. and listen to them together read them together um and slow down slow the heck down with your life so you mm. can just be and um you know poetry is kind of like meditation in a way mm. it's, it's like a i remember when i was in my 20s i would like sometimes climb a mountain with a book of poetry and just mm. sit and read the poetry or sometimes read it out loud and was there a specific book that you're thinking well, of? Well, you actually, that? yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember sitting like um, on the coast uh, uh, in California, like Tabanga Canyon, mm -hmm. up on the hills, looking over the ocean on this sort of, you know, escarpment, looking over. And, and I had Rilke, mm -hmm. uh, a book yeah. of poems by Rilke. It's a German poet from the early um, 20th century. Uh, and I, I, it's just it's such beautiful poetry. Which book? Do you remember? I think it was a Duna elegies okay. um, and uh, it just 
it just was so much about love and you know like the, he talked about this concept of in seeing like you know mm. seeing somebody's soul and i think that's uh you know like honestly just sitting here talking to you today i'm like you know i've been going through this process of myself just mm. sort of rethinking what i'm doing and how i'm being and how i want to live and you know, what, what, matters. Have, what have you been thinking of and what have what have you been aspiring well, I, to? I, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was in the more being stage. Yeah. And then for the last 30 years, I've been in the more doing stage. Mm -hmm. And I want to get back to being a human being instead of a human doing. Right. <laughs> and not dealing with 400 emails a day and not having right. to be in 10 cities in 20 days. And just, just do good work, mm -hmm. but really change what I'm doing because I think I'll be more effective. Right. I'll be happier. And I... I'm craving it. I feel right. like I, you know, I, I'm craving it, and I got a lot of joy from the things I do. I get a lot of nourishment from my family and friends. I get mm -hmm. a lot of good, but the just the unplug, like, right? You know, and just be. Yeah, um, it's just funny because my wife and literally were talking about that last night about t me taking a, a week or two and just you know, taking a walking a walking tour like I did before, just walking. <laughs> it's necessary. I really think it's like a necessary part mm -hmm. of. Uh, the recharging process yeah. you know like and a pilgrimage like absolutely like you, do. Yeah. you know and it, when you do that also you remove all of your stories yeah. and you're just in the world i know where i know where i want to go i've dreamt of going my whole life where would you go um, or where you, will you go well mount kailash where's that mount kailash is in tibet and it's this oh go it's this sacred mountain that is at, i think seventeen thousand feet mm. um and it's a pilgrimage site uh, and, and Buddhist pilgrims come to this mountain and they literally do prostrations. Every step is a prostration around the mm. entire mountain. Mm. Um, so and, a prostration, like a walking meditation. So or? literally they like, like you've seen Buddhists bow down. So they literally bow down, get to their knees, go flat on the ground, fully extended. Mm. Like you're in a boat pose yeah. and then stand up, take a step and do it again. Bow down, prostrate yourself. Got it. And do that. That's how they go around the entire mountain. That's amazing. And it's a, that would a, what a sight that would be to see. It's a heck of a journey, um, but it's it's something that I've long wanted to do, and uh, you should dreamt about. You doing should a it. thousand percent do it. You know, there's a great book by a, a guy known Robert Thurman uh -huh. uh, called "Circling the Sacred Mountain," and it's it's. I read the book, and I just I'm just so hungry to go on that journey. Look, I know you have. Uh, first of all. It, it, Far be it from me to give advice, but I know you have such an amazing life. You have such amazing, uh, this thing that you've built really impacts and influences people in a positive way all around the world. And as I said, there's no way to quantify it, mm. but also the thing that you need to do to feed yourself will also feed other people. Yeah. And I think you should please, please like as a gift to me and to yourself and to everyone who looks up to you and to, you know, who gets stuff from your content. You know, please do that. Yeah. I got a chance. I came back recently from India and uh, I was able to be at uh, a monastery with the Dalai Lama for uh, this guy named Lama Senkapa, his 600 year celebration into uh, transcending into Nirvana. He was one of the earlier teachers of Buddhism. Yeah. And it was What's the first. What's he eating? Because he, he's 600 years old. I want to know. He's a really good guy. Very, very energetic, you know, plant based for the most part. You know? No, uh, anyway, so this was a big celebration for him, though, because he was one of the teachers to mm -hmm. the Dalai Lama. Yeah. And yeah. so we get a chance to meet the Dalai Lama. Mm. And uh, it was unbelievable, man. It was like a small group of us and literally thousands and thousands of monks that came to celebrate this really special thing. And, uh, and so when we met the Dalai Lama, he comes in and he sits down and we all kind of gather around him like children looking up to somebody who's reading a storybook. And he, he goes like this, he goes, compassion. And then he continued on. I didn't hear anything else he said <laughs> after that because the word compassion was like, I had never heard it before. Yeah. You know, because it's not always what someone says and it's not always how they say it, it's who says it yeah. and what they've been through. Yeah. And I could just feel his experience of compassion when he said that. Yeah. Um, but being in that environment, being in that new environment where I get to take off all the stories that I have, yeah. it was necessary. And, and then I came back recharged yeah, to so uh, reapproach my poetry so career great. in life. Yeah, so, it's so true. We need those experiences. 
and, and you know, we, we, we all live our little narrow lives. And I remember being in, uh, in northern Nepal, uh, and I met, I met this Tibetan doctor because I was wanted to study about Tibetan medicine. I went and sat with him for a day, mm. and he told me a story. He'd been in a Chinese gulag for 22 years, tortured and beaten and deprived of everything, 22 years. Finally got out, and I, I said, what was the hardest part about being there? He says, well, it was the moments where I thought I was going to lose compassion for my Chinese jailers. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Wow. <laughs> whoa. Okay. So I got, That's some, another level. I got some work to do here. Right. <laughs> so, um, NQ, thank you for the work you do in the world. Thank, thank you, you for being the sword of Manjushri, which is the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist uh, uh, symbol of someone who cuts through the illusion with wisdom so thank you you're man. that dude that means a lot to me man you're that dude and everybody's got to get this book inquire within yeah and, and if the you do, audiobook by the way if you get the book reach out to me on social media yeah. you know i'm at nq life let me know that you got the book uh post about it i, I want to spread the word as much as i can i literally never had a home for my art like this mm. and so self-promotion so has always been an issue for me no, but promoting on, this book is a joy no this is great everybody everybody's gotta get it and and I think it would be great even to you know gather with your friends and read the poems out loud sure. to each other and like have that, I mean, this that shared experience. I mean, I, you know, I literally feel transformed just sitting here. I feel like I got a private poetry reading Thank you, bro. by a superstar. I'm like, whoa, I feel so blessed. And uh, and I'm grateful for you and, and everybody check it out. And, uh, inquire Within on Amazon, it's available now. Uh, please get it. Uh, it'll, it'll move you, it'll wake you up, it'll inspire you. Um, I'm already like, wow, I don't I think I have to just go like take a walk because I just need <laughs> like, uh, and uh, it's been great having you on Dr. Swampsy podcast. Sharing. If you love this podcast, please share it with your friends, family, on social media, leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Um, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and we'll see you next time on the Doctor's Pharmacy. Appreciate you, bro.